James, we just had Ted Kubias on. And dude, I think that guy loves SEO more than any of us. What do you think? Dude, he's a smart dude. Very smart. Dude. I've talked to him a couple of times. Met him in Vegas uh, a few months ago at a conference and chatted to him there a few times. Man, he is a wealth of information. And anyone who... Yeah. Anyone who loves SEO or looking for some tips for their own websites, man, listen to this. And uh, I mean, he jumps through a few things around fun, like SEO fundamentals, some tests that he's run, um, breaking a little bit down commission-based SEO. I um, also went down the road of AI, kind of some AI business. Dude, that AI business idea was actually pretty interesting. I checked out that site yeah. too. Um, and listeners can check it out when he mentions it in the pod as well. And um, just the idea of how he's using AI and then some different bits and pieces of how he ranks semi-competitive keywords number one in three weeks on a brand new website, which is uh, pretty cool. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I think, guys, give it a listen. Let us know what you think. But, yeah, it was a, a bit different format than we're, what we're used to. But uh, if you guys like it, do let us know. We're going to have them on again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we'll try to get a few more of those SEO Fight Club guys on. But make sure you check the link in the description. Join the advice community. Man, that thing's popping off every single day. Use that link, you get 10% off for life. Plus, you don't have to interview, you get straight into that community. So use that link down below. Thank you, coupon codes indexy. Let's do that link anyway, and you'll be in there. We discuss all things SEO, digital marketing, shit, anything you want to discuss in there to help you with your businesses. Perfect. Yeah, give it a listen, guys. Thanks. What's good, everyone? It's Jack and Chow. And this is James DeLacy. And you're listening to This Week in Digital Marketing. So we have Ted Kobias on today. Kobitis? How, how do I yeah, pronounce Kobitis. it? Kobitis. Yeah. Kobitis. Sorry you got about it right. that. Um, butchered yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no. So nice you, to meet you, you Ted. Get it perfect. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show. Amazing. So why don't you give the audience a bit of background? Um, some people may not know who you are. I think you're big in the, like you go to a ton of conferences. So may, maybe people have seen you around, but uh, to give you like a sense of uh, our listeners, they're mostly like niche site owners. So like content site o- owners and like business yeah. owners. Yeah. I, I kind of had a, uh, meandering path into SEO. So I, I got my start at the university of Illinois, uh, in Champaign Urbana. I was working at the national center for supercomputing applications, uh, back in the nineties. Uh, had the office across the hall from Mark Andreessen, who would later form oh. uh, Netscape. Uh, this was during the era when he came out with the NCSA Mosaic web browser, which was the first graphical web browser, uh, which I had a copy of while it still required a signed NDA. Um, oh, wow. And uh, so, yeah, my my origin story goes all the way back to the beginning. So I'm dating myself there a bit. Um, Later, uh, I was uh, hired to work at Microsoft doing uh, uh, writing bots and spiders to analyze dot com companies for acquisitions. I um, in doing so, I managed to earn myself a couple of the Barksdale uh, testimony bullet items in the Microsoft antitrust case. So, what is that? that uh, yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the youngsters don't know. Uh, Microsoft during the browser wars was uh, sued for. Uh, uh, antitrust law for being a monopoly in the browser war. No one could win. It was all Microsoft. Mm. Uh, they controlled everything. Now, today, mm. it's that times 10 with Google, but nobody knows. You know, nobody remembers. Just a, a, a few of us mm. people who went through it all, and we're like, what do you mean? My, Microsoft, they were, you know... They were skewered with all of that in the media. And and nobody says a thing about Google now. It's like, what the hell happened? And uh, 
yeah, yeah, it's just crazy. It's 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 interesting to to look at where we are today through the lens of the past for sure. Um, eventually I got into my own startups and I sold those in 2004, landed into <laughs> online retail and did online retail. Uh, and that's really where I, I built my SEO skills, uh, did that for like over 17 years and Whoa. in online retail, uh, they just said, Hey, Ted, uh, we need to handle a thing called SEO, look into it, find out about it for us. And uh, so I was a junior guy on the web development team, and I came back and I said, well, it, it sounds like it's an optimization problem. We have to kind of test things out to see how they work in search engines. And, uh, and, and then on the things that work well, we need to do them everywhere. So I need our smallest store. At the time, they had like 15 stores. And so I took the one they were thinking about closing down because it didn't make any money. And that was my test bed. And so I'd read a blog, learn about a thing, test it out on the small store. Oh, that didn't work. All right, undo, sweep it under the rug. No need to look at that. Uh, read another blog, uh, get some advice, try it out. Oh, no, that was crap. Didn't work. Sweep it under the rug read another blog, try it out. Holy crap, that one was amazing. Hey, hey guys, hey boss, you know, we need to do this thing to the other 14 big stores. And they're like, holy cow, Ted, that was double digit growth and organic. And the, then I, you know, lather, rinse and repeat that process. So all of my mistakes were getting swept under the rug. But all of my successes were the Midas touch in front of the executive team. It is my fastest climbing of the corporate ladder ever. I, I, I went from being the new guy in the web dev bullpen to being the director of business intelligence at the right hand of the CEO in like a year. Uh, it, it was incredible. It was... Uh, I. I think I had a stretch of like almost uh, uh, seven or eight years of double digit uh, growth for the company. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was an incredible journey. Um, then uh, eventually, I, in that journey, uh, this was back when PageRank was being published, I helped them grow all the way to PageRank 8. Um, and in the course of that time, uh, their revenue went from like 5 million to 65 million and $40 average carts. And of yeah. course <laughs> I got fired four times for doing it, uh, because I was a commission based SEO and there are problems with commission-based SEO. And we can talk about those if you like, or we could go into actual SEO. But it's interesting if you've ever thought, oh, I want to be a commission-based SEO. Just remember that when you're the highest paid employee in the company after you knock it out of the park, everyone hates you, including the business owner. And they always think that your best work is behind you and you can't possibly do it again. So they always want to fire you to cut costs. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing to be a commission-based SEO. you got to have a thick skin and you got to kind of predict the <laughs> well, future. J Jackie's doing that right now. At almost, I guess you could call it commission-based SEO, right? If you're, called, if you're doing rev share? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Um yeah, but our, our agreements are structured way more aggressively because yours is a employment contract, right? That's why they could just yeah. fire you four times, which is insane. But yeah. I'm surprised but they hired you back after they fired you. No. Did like traffic well, just the, tank the, when they're like, oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. When, when you're in a 300 person company and you're dealing with the traffic volumes and everybody has a great idea, most of their great ideas will come at the expense of SEO. It usually involves a website redesign and some new feature. 
And if you don't have an SEO for that type of migration, yeah, all all of that growth goes away overnight. And so, yeah, yeah each, I, each yeah. time I came back, it was like, we need you back. We've lost millions. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it, it just got to a point where after the, the fourth time is like a bridge to burn. Hmm. Got it. And what was your comp like? Is it directly tied to like SEO performance? And how did you attribute that? Like, how did you segment out, uh, for example, did you segment they, out uh, branded search? Yeah, yeah. I, I never claim branded search. And uh, so a lot of people won't don't understand the, the complexity of branded search in the homepage. It's almost impossible to claim SEO credit on, on a homepage because all channel marketing results in some amount of organic branded search. So if you have a TV commercial or a billboard or magazine ads or email campaigns or social, uh, people see that stuff and they Google your name. So you can't take credit for it. Um, and it's all gone to the home page. So if you want definitive credit for a keyword out of organic, it's got to be an actual keyword and on an inner page. And so you, you got to go aggressive there. In terms of, of how uh, SEO commission structures are put together, there's basically uh, two strategies. You can have a small percentage of, of all organic, uh, or you can have a larger percentage of new money. And uh, I did the, the smaller percentage of all organic and threw in a base salary because I had a wife and kids and was worried about health insurance. And so that's the safe play. In hindsight, I should have taken a larger percentage of new money. <laughs> that would have been a lot more money. So, uh, but you got to be uh, bold and brave to go that avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if if you can stomach the fear, then and you're really good at SEO, then that's probably your best money. Got it. Yeah, I'm uh, risk on all the time. So that that's right <laughs> up my alley. Um, <laughs> Ted, so. Why don't you, uh, what are you up to now? Because you mentioned uh, e-commerce with that, with that company. It's, uh, you've been fired four times, so you're out. Um, I noticed you have some software uh, companies. And yeah, what are you yeah. doing like day to day now? I, I went in uh, to business for myself. I have a small company uh, by any uh, financial statement standards. It's a small business. Um, but that's not a knock on it. Like you can be a millionaire with a small business. That's no problem. Um, but, uh, I make software, you know, that's, that's something I found that I, I just really love doing. I, I make software for people who are good SEOs and want to achieve that status of, of great SEOs. And, Kind of the, the novel idea in the software is, uh, <clears throat> is that I'm trying to bring some scientific method to uh, an industry that's largely filled with snake oil. And I don't, I don't mean to offend everyone, but there's a lot of belief-based culture uh, within SEO, you know, Google only hires the best. Google wouldn't lie. The algorithm is too smart for that. You know, you, you've heard all these things and you've seen contradicting advice out of Google. Like they'll say, you know, in one article, you know, never build backlinks. That's the worst thing you can do. And then they'll come back and say, not all backlinks are bad. And, you know, it's like you can't even get a straight story out of Google, let alone out of the community, because everybody's, you know, they're all quoting Google and Google's contradicting itself. So the whole industry is contradicting itself. So what do you need to do? You need to run a test. You know, you need to find some truth. 
and it's amazing when you start proving things for yourself, you have this amazing new superpower that others don't have. If you can prove like three or four fundamentals of SEO for yourself beyond any shadow of a doubt, then you can go and read these articles and when you, when you get to a point where one of them, you know, violates your fundamental truth number three, you don't have to read it anymore. You know they're full of crap. Because, you know, when you're reading a news article and they talk about how all of these round earthers don't realize that the earth is actually flat, you know, do you need to read the rest of that news article? No, you, you're like, oh, it's one of those. Let's move on. But then when you do find an article that matches truth number one, truth number two, truth number three, how interested are you in the next thing they have to share? And so you got this amazing bullshit detector that saves you hundreds of hours of time, but you can only get that you only get to play that game if you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt a few fundamentals for yourself no one can prove it for you you have to believe in those fundamentals <clears throat> and um these like fundamentals are always changing how do you keep like up to date with these fundamentals with like there's so many variables out there right there's no single variable test out there right now how, how would you come up with these fundamentals and how do you keep them up to date without like breaking the bank well uh see i'm gonna challenge that because there's a lot of uh assumptions and in, in in the questions you asked uh there are single variable tests there are entire communities of seos who do scientific single variable testing in seo uh, uh seointel.com is one they have like seven or eight hundred single variable tests in seo F scientific method written uh test specifications hypothesis test setup to reproduce uh, results uh findings from the testing um uh, kyle roof in our industry he's known for for pioneering a lot of those tests. Uh, IMG is another group that does single variable testing. Um, I've led testing groups for years. Um, so there's, there's a ton of testing. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there and we see it in signals lab where they say, Oh, that's unknowable or you can't test that. Are you sure about that? Like, we we sent people to the moon, and you're saying we can't test something in SEO? Like, no way. We're, we're human beings. We can test the shit out of some SEO. <laughs> and so all, all you need, like, there's this uh, other belief that, you know, oh, the, the algorithm has AI in it, so it's, it's beyond our ability to test. No, no. All you need to figure out best practices and the most complicated AI technologies there are is basic statistics. Because we're not trying to make those technologies that use AI. We're just trying to figure out what things we can do are better than what everybody else is doing. And that's baseball stats. As far as the math you need to min-max, that's not complicated at all. You can test a lot. And so we test every day. You know, we test different things. Uh, and ridiculous things, because we find that the dumber the test idea, the more we stand to learn from it. So at What's one an point, example I ran... of a... yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I ran uh, a test. I was like, I, I wonder if I put a million words that the world has never seen before in a blog post. I wonder how many of them I can get indexed in Google. 
And this this caused a number of problems for us because, A, it's really hard to put a million words in a WordPress post. Like, you, you got to do some tricks to even get that to publish. Um, and then uh, on top of that, uh, we had to, to go back to our statistics advisors. We were like, hey, we have a problem. We can't actually rank track a million keywords. So we we need to figure out a way how to check how this is performing. And, and they came back and said, hey, yeah, we deal with this every day. All you need to do is random sampling. And so we did that through throughout our uh, word base. But it was so interesting because the answer was so definitive. It was the first 200,000 words were indexed. Nothing after that. So random sampling in the first 200,000 had 100% indexation. Random sampling in, in the bottom 800,000, 0% across the whole thing. So there's a cliff on where the words get indexed. And that cliff was about three megabytes in. So if you're looking for evidence of how much content you can get in, it was about three megabytes. Um, and uh, it was top-down order, and it took about 48 hours to index 200,000 words. And they do the first ones first, and they go in sequential order for how it gets processed. Top-down, left to right. Um, and then we were wondering, you know, uh, everyone kept saying, well, you, your title needs to be a certain length. And we were like, well, let's, let's test that. Cause I wonder how many words in a title can get indexed. So we took the 200,000 words for, you know, that, that amount of words, we made a new page, new words and everything. And but we put 200,000 words in the title on the WordPress blog. Any guess how many got indexed? All of them. <laughs> yep. All 200,000 words were findable in search. Your title can be any length up to the limit that they process for the page, which has interesting implications because you know how uh, your title uh, gets an ellipsis at some point in search. So mm. it's technically situational cloaking beyond the ellipsis. So anything you have after that limit is content that can help you rank, but isn't really uh, observable unless uh, people view source. What's the and implication so then with the... Um... With the first 200,000 words you mentioned, Google goes through it kind of top down. Does that mean that we should be placing maybe our most important links further up the top because it gets crawled top down or does it really matter? If, if it took a long time to index, it would matter. But the fact that uh, it starts indexing within 24 hours and it finishes within 48 when Google's in good working condition, I don't think it matters much. Hmm. And that's if the same thing, obviously, with, with where you place your keywords in as well within the article, if you're going that granular. Yeah, and because, like, let's let's think about the use case of where you want to publish new content that's only relevant for 48 hours. That would be, like, uh, a popular news site where after 48 hours, the story trails off. Um, so in those cases, you're not going to do a 200,000-word article. Your article's going to be 4,000 words. So that's going to be done within an hour. So, yeah, it, it won't matter the word order. Hmm. Gotcha. And do you have your, um, besides these testings, I mean, what do you, are you more excited about, like, finding, like, testing your hypotheses? Or are you more, like, after the money that's at the end? Do you know what I mean? Because some people go into SEO for different reasons. You seem to be in, in, in it with like gaming the algo, it's, it seems. It's not so much the money well, at the end, huh? Well, it, it's, it's largely uh, the, the money is what makes the testing fun, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's a min-max game. You know, it's, 
it's the the same thing as playing uh, uh, a game like Diablo or Path of X. Exile. You're you're looking for game breaking combination. We were, just, we were just talking about Diablo and the advice community, like just before this podcast. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> and and when you're in a min max community, they're gonna like min max games. You know that doesn't surprise me. Um, and so yeah, it's all about finding game breaking combos that that make you. Uh, crack up they're so ridiculously overpowered and so we're looking for game breaking combos and seo and so that's that's fun and and if we can make a living doing that and if we can help people and we can do all these things then it's a lot of fun and so yeah i I like uh making software that, that helps do that and there's a couple things that that come out of it um one thing is i i really don't care what is or isn't a factor. I'm I'm just not emotionally invested in what the outcomes of these tests should be. Like I, I just I don't care if keyword density works or doesn't work. But if there's good evidence to support it, either way, I'm really interested in that. I like knowing what works and I like knowing what's a waste of time. Because those those pieces right there are advantage and i knew uh years ago that at any moment google can change the rules on us and then we have to kind of relearn everything and so in in many regards we're we're like those early physicists trying to figure out the laws of nature we're like isaac newton and we're trying to figure out <laughs> how things work <laughs> And we're just, we're not looking for quantum mechanics yet. We're not that far along. We are trying to figure out what is a force, you know, within what we do. And honestly, you know, Newton and Einstein and Stephen Hawking, man, those fuckers had it easy. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know if I should swear. (laughs) No, you can't. can't. Please keep going. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Uh those guys had it easy because nobody was in there mucking with the universal constants and the laws of nature. You know, it's not like they had somebody saying, "Oh, well gravity is less of a thing today than it was yesterday and uh you know, Planck's constant is now doubled." You know. <laughs> so in our industry, we're doing what what Newton was trying to do, but we have a supreme being that is mucking with the fundamental laws of nature on us, and that is remarkably complicated. Uh, but it turns out it's uh, philosophically interesting because now we can, you know, we can look at science itself and say hey is there evidence in regular science that there's somebody mucking with the laws of nature because we've adapted scientific method to look for that is how is science different when somebody's mucking with your fundamental laws and so science actually is a different beast and so what does that prove well it, it kind of proves in normal science that there isn't a supreme being mucking with the fundamental laws of nature. And that last part is important. I'm not saying there isn't a supreme being, just saying there isn't one that's mucking with the fundamental laws. Those remain static for Newton and Einstein. They don't remain static in SEO because Google keeps modifying the coefficients. And on that, so it's on a that result, topic, Ted. No, you, wait, you finish off. Second. You finish off. Yeah, yeah. As a result, what you need to do in a world where those fundamental laws and fundamental forces are changing underneath you is you need to figure out how fast you can relearn all of science. You got to repeat all of Newton's work all the time. And that's how science becomes different. And when you look at my software and what we're doing, we're relearning SEO. 
on a daily basis. We wake up in the morning and compare how did SEO change today from a week ago, a month ago. And so we, mm. we are building tools that let us relearn from scratch. Yeah, and we will definitely be diving into your tool too in a bit. I wanted to jump to a little bit of, I guess, the ever-changing landscape around around AI. And I remember we were chatting in Vegas, and I think you mentioned about there's companies now opting out of uh, AI or opting out of using or having their content help AI learn, et cetera. And you were saying they were shooting themselves in the foot. And I think I got that. I think I heard that right. Tell me if I got that wrong. But do you want to maybe explain yeah, that a bit? There's a number of dimensions to this question. When when companies shoot themselves in the foot, it's usually because they've set up uh, their security appliances and load balancers and their cloud flare uh, to block traffic that isn't human and isn't a whitelisted bot. You know, you block all bots, you know, that type of thing. And one of the bots uh, they're commonly blocking is Common Crawl. And when you block Common Crawl, then your website doesn't get to be trained on for ChatGPT and other AIs. And so a, a lot of businesses right now have shot themselves in the foot because when people go and ask AI about their industry or about their business specifically, it's got nothing for them. So you need to unblock that if you want to be part of the answers in those questions going forward. Oh, okay, that, that makes sense. And I know also you mentioned as well, because we have a lot, of, a lot of listeners that are, that are builders and always looking at different businesses, et cetera. And you were talking about a bunch of different AI businesses, kind of you rattled off the top of your head that you think would be interesting and easy to do, but obviously for someone like yourself who has less time to do it, isn't feasible, but for someone with more time might be feasible. I think one of those was like a children's storytelling app or something like that. I mean, you've got a bunch, don't you? Oh yeah. Yeah. There, there's plenty like nowadays, uh, and I got to credit Terry Power for for this knowledge because he kind of went and played with it all and, and prototyped it and shared it with the community. Uh, nowadays, you can you can build your own uh, isolated uh, chat GPTs. There there's websites out there like Custom GPT where you give it PDFs of information and it can it can learn the information and then do question answers chat gpt style prompting against the pdfs and it's it's remarkable and so yeah you could uh do that for uh you know websites and improve their site search and sell that as a value add you know it takes you a weekend you charge five grand for it and leather rents repeat all day long that's that's a million dollar <laughs> business right there you could get into the financial analysis markets you, those pdfs you know what comes in pdfs 10q filings you know who would like to do question answers against a body of 10q filings and you could just load it up with all apple you know filings and now you have the best answer engine for for apple uh, financial information um, mm. you know, <laughs> you can't tell me that's not a million dollar idea. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. there's spontaneous genesis on this stuff. Like if I'm rattling it off and hundreds of people have probably thought about it before me, statistically, if I'm in the average of the bell curve, there's somebody that's way out in front. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can cookie cutter to so many industries and, there's yeah if you're afraid of ai and you're out there just blasting it going i can write better you're you're missing the mark you've missed the opportunity of it and there's a lot of people that are fearful they're like oh google is gonna punish it well that that's another assumption so let's kind of look at that for a second is google gonna punish ai um well if they punish it uh, then we're all millionaires in reputation management, right? 
So we can mm -hmm. we can go to a product and we can write a favorable review that tanks the product because they're punishing it. And our favorable review was written with what AI. We could go to a blog post and write an insightful mm -hmm. on-topic response, and it tanks the blog post. Why? Because it was written with AI. And then they say, well, Ted, that's just user-generated content. Google will just make an exception for user-generated content. Great. Now I just got to flag my AI content as user-generated, and I've got to work around to Google's punishment. See, it's, it's an arms race. It never ends. And so they can't punish it without weaponizing it, and that's why it'll never be punished. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it'll ever be punished. Um, well, now, now with the release of AI, how are, how are you using it in your like everyday work or uh, life? The, the the amazing thing. This is where uh, you know, if you're out there listening or watching, uh, you may want to uh, you may want to read the quality raters guidelines with fresh eyes. And in fact, you don't even need to read the whole thing. Just open it up and do a find and search on the word supplemental content and, and read about what Google thinks about relevant supplemental content. And when you do that, you're going to realize that they're looking for it. And when it's relevant, it should be positively scored on page. It's white hat. And when you look at examples of supplemental content, so your article, the thing that most people are cramming SEO into, which is hard and weird. You know, when you cram a lot of SEO in that main article, you have to admit it's weird. <laughs> um, but when you look at the supplemental content on the page, you know, here's a list of things to consider when selecting a DUI lawyer in Los Angeles. You know, that's mm -hmm. a list, so you can cram a lot in a list. It doesn't even have rules of grammar. It's a list. That's why uh, list-style uh, content can get such crazy high keyword density. And it's why Google doesn't punish keyword density. Everybody's like, oh, Google will punish you. No, we, we see up to 65, 70% keyword density in the wild. But beyond 12.5%, that's what you can get in the main content because you have grammar you have to adhere to. Uh, but you can see it go up to 65% on the list style content. And what's good at making lists? AI. AI is fantastic for making lists. And people are like, oh, well, I can write a better article. Can you write a more authoritative list? Because I've seen your human written list. They are not more authoritative. Uh, hmm. So that that's just facts. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, so it seems like you have a lot going on. I mean, you have your software businesses, which you mentioned is you consider a small business, but I'm sure to other people, it's like a full-time thing. Uh, besides that, do you have any like affiliate sites? Do you have any display ad sites? Do you do consulting? Like what's the, what, what's your revenue stream? I, yeah. It, well, it all, it all starts with your time management, right? There's only so many hours in a day. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I spend probably about 60% of my time uh, just talking with people, supporting people, helping people, um, uh, primarily my customers. Uh, and I spend about 40% of my time doing R&D type activities. Um, because of that, I, I don't have a big client roster anymore. Selling software is my thing. Uh, but about, you know, six or seven times typically is personal favors. Uh, I'll do what I consider like emergency SEO. Uh, sometimes that emergency SEO is in the form of like helping an agency land a big enterprise. Um, in which case I'm helping them do like a, an audit that will impress an enterprise caliber business. Um, sometimes it's emergency SEO. 
and uh, in the emergency SEO, it normally comes in the in the shape of this. Um, yeah, I was listening to all these SEO experts. I was listening to Ted and Kyle and Clint and, and Craig and, and Chris Palmer and 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 I did all of their advice on my page and my page drop. And so it's in that form of, you know, too many cooks and, and it spoiled the soup. And and what that typically causes, like the story also includes that, oh, I was killing it for years and then recently the page dropped. And uh, so they have this crisis of faith in the fundamentals of SEO and they don't know what works anymore. And what typically I end up doing in those things, uh, bef- you know, right up to the point before they they give up completely, I'll, I'll help them out with a Hail Mary. And in that Hail Mary play, uh, I say, you pick the URL, you pick the keyword, but I write the content, you know, from their website that was ranking before Tank Now. Those are the things. So, they pick the page, they pick the term, I write the content. And I just take their content, stuff it in a Word doc, we can undo if we want to, and then I just return to the fundamentals. I focus on the target keyword, I get relevant entities about the target keyword, I get the the relevancy on page math right, I double check that we're competitive in referring domains. Um, and when when we do these things, I make sure they have good factor diversity. And when we do these things, like the last time I did it, it took 48 hours to take this guy who, you know, was number one, fell out of search for a long, long time. He's back at number one. <laughs> and so now, now he's looking at that at that piece of of content that was designed to restore his faith and the basic fundamentals of SEO and he's he's building that into all of his processes um, and hmm. oftentimes what people don't realize when you, when you hit these problems is that your your SEO is lacking it's not that his SEO was bad. I don't even believe in bad SEO. I know it's out there, but it's remarkably hard to find examples of bad SEO. What you actually are running into is incomplete SEO. They're doing some of the right things, just not enough of it and not in enough of the correct places. So it's not what they did was bad. It's incomplete. And when you start viewing it that way, it begs the question, what are we missing? Where are the gaps? We need some measurement data. And when you get that measurement data about what the people who are ranking have and you don't, now you can formulate a strategy. How can we eliminate these deficits? And if you think about a uh, Google uh, algorithm, that's Google. You know, they've coded factors into the system, but they can, from time to time, change the coefficients. So they can say, we're going to make backlinks weaker and exact uh, exact match mentions stronger, and that's our update. Well, depending upon whether or not you were weak in one or the other or both of those, that update will make your website go sharply up or sharply down, all right? But when you eliminate all of your factor deficits, you tend to not move. You just kind of coast through on the level. And then, uh, so if on this last update you went sharply up, that means you're, you're missing factors. That means you are good in one, but you were missing the other. But the other one got less important, and the one you had got more important, so you went sharply up. If you go sharply down, that means you were set up well, but now what they're looking at is more important, and you don't have enough of it, so you went sharply down. So if you go sharply up or down, you have gaps in your SEO, and you've got to measure. In your example of... uh 
the emergency SEO where you told the guy they pick their URL and you write the content. Um, in that scenario, I personally, from like my own sites, what I saw was once like a domain is kind of hit on an update, it's like domain wide. It wasn't, it's not like on a page basis, but I guess in this example, it's, it was that singular page got hit on an update, it dropped out of search and the other pages stayed stagnant or did it, uh, well, or, well, yeah, how did the other pages he, react? There, there. There are different kinds of problems, and some kinds can be site-wide, but it could be page-level and coincidentally site-wide. Because let's say you designed a uh, process for how your pages are to be written, and you are really strict about that process, that page level impact could be site-wide because you did it to all pages. Mm -hmm. It's not that it was a site-wide impact in that example. It's that you did a page-level problem site-wide. And so hmm. you got you to gotta realize that you, you may not know if Google is affecting the whole domain or the same problem on many pages. And so the test you would do is you would try to recover one page. And if it recovers then you know it's not a site-wide thing because you yeah, shouldn't yeah. be able to recover site-wide on one page's effort. Gotcha, gotcha. So you you take these, like, steps each time when you're trying to, like, recover a site. You wouldn't try to implement anything site-wide because then uh, it would remove... You would then... You won't know what, like, changed... Uh, well, what fixed it, right? I, I have a, a concept that that I have been working with and sharing. I call it minimum viable SEO. What is the least amount of SEO I can do to get the desired outcome for a page? I do not want to overspend it all because it's in that model of minimum viable SEO that as agencies, we find our profitability. So it's important to, to know where that limit is. But it's also important to know that minimum viable SEO is weak SEO. That is not dominating. That is barely crossing the finish line. And people tend to compete well with minimum viable SEO. And you don't want that. You want to dominate. Um, but it's good to know where the limits are set. Because that's your profitability. You don't want to go you don't want to overinvest too much. And so what what I find in my model of minimum viable SEO is I can rank for a keyword that requires some amount of off-page to rank well. So that's the first requirement. It can't be so easy that you can do it with on-page alone. It has to require uh, off-page. When I set up a new domain, create a new page, and rank it for that keyword, the fastest I can get to number one is three weeks. And largely that delay is because of the off-page SEO processing on Google's side. And so I have other SEOs like Lee Witcher, and there's a few more. Uh, we have this just ongoing gentleman's contest to see who can break the speed record of rank of ranking these, and so Lee is currently working on a strategy to break my three weeks. And um, uh, any anybody in the world's welcome to play this game. It's called learning SEO, uh, <laughs> and I recommend it. But with with the minimum SEO, I I'll tell you my formula. Even uh, I buy a domain name, I send out a press release before I even set up the host. Because I know the domain name, I know the homepage URL. Get that started. Then I'll set up the hosting. I'll create a one-page website. I'll get the data for how my one-page website is different from the top-ranking pages out there. And I'll tune it in a day on page. And then I'll request indexing. And a good amount of the time, it'll enter into search on page one. Like, I don't have to climb it to page one. That It'll just start on page one. 
And a lot of people don't realize that you could do it. I can make a new website and it'll start on page one. Some of the time, it'll start at number one on page one. You can right, start what, at what, the top. What, quick question. What type of what types of keywords are these? Because you mentioned like they would be considered a bit higher difficulty. Are they like yeah, super high difficulty, like casino keywords, or are they more like no, no. You you, know I mean? There's a reality here. So uh I'm I'm largely interested in the broad eighty percent of keywords, not the top twenty percent. Okay. So okay, the broad eighty percent is what most of us SEOs deal with day in, day out. They tend to be things like, you know, best SEO software or Seattle Plumber, you know, they tend right. the broad eighty percent looks like that. When you say, Well, if you're so good, why don't you have payday loans? Well, you know, <laughs> there's a twenty year history and head start on link building for payday loans. There is not a three month SEO contract that's gonna negate that twenty year advantage. So there's a reality to some keywords. Some keywords you have to say, yeah, that's not gonna happen fast. That's gonna take time and money and so gotcha. that's a reality well, well, why do you go down the road of, of press releases here because obviously there's different thoughts on press releases whether they work or not or whether they're valuable links why why the press release versus going after guest post niche edits etc uh several several things um so one of which is page rank itself as you climb up in levels of page rank you constantly need 10 times as many links at half the cost just to get to the next level. And by the time you get to about page rank six, you need to be acquiring 100% of your links for free. So if you run the math on page rank, you realize that you cannot pay $200 a link. Uh, not, not unless you have tens of millions to hundreds of millions of link uh, dollars and link building budget you just can't do it so this this type of link building that you're talking about it's a small websites game and really its function is i want my new website to behave like a medium business and that's that's kind of i want a good start that's the game because I want a good start. And then after the good start, you kind of need natural forces to take over. You need people to talk about your business and share your content. <laughs> and so you need you need that engine or you have to go very black hat. And I, I don't want to teach going very black hat. So uh, I, I look at the practicality of the link building and most businesses should outgrow the need to do it. And that's why enterprise SEOs, they think link building's stupid. I don't know why you'd ever do it. Because they're spending the authority of their already established brand. The enterprise SEO doesn't realize that the local SEO needs to build those early business backlinks because that makes the phone ring. <laughs> and yeah. so the work at the bottom of the page rank ladder is very different work than the work at the top. So why specifically press releases? It ends up being a number for me. So I like to deal with diversity factors. I've found that they're the strongest factors in SEO statistically. And uh, referring domains is, is a diversity factor. So it's the number of places you're drawing authority from. And so I want to address that. And I, I don't even really care if it's like, quality i think it needs to be closer to an average internet backlink average internet backlinks they're quite low quality and when you look at a page rank 7 page rank 8 you know theoretical website out there like a walmart or something they don't have a quality backlink profile it's all garbage when you look at a site that big so they're they're coming in at the average and so when you look at those big companies You'll see what the average looks like, and those are generally the links you ought to say yes to, unless you have a good reason not to. Um, and so uh, I just am trying to get a number. And for that broad 80% of keywords I mentioned, you know, the 
um, best SEO software, Seattle Plumber, whatever they have you working on in your agency, that broad 80%, uh, most of the time you'll be short between zero and 500 referring domains. Say about 80% of the time of the 80%. And uh, uh, so in that case, you can meet that deficit with one press release not eight not 12 one that's the off-page strategy for that keyword one and done it's fast it's safe even google does press releases google can't say we don't like press releases because you can go see they freaking love press releases all right so one and done. Keep it relevant about the keyword you're trying to rank for. Point it at the page you're trying to rank. Use a relevant anchor text. And people then make the assumption of, oh, I need to do one press release for every page on my site. No. No. Usually by the time you get to two or three, you're kind of outclassing everybody else in your space most of the time. Uh, I'm sure there are exceptions, but most of the time, by the time you get to two or three, your competition has done so little, you're you're just outclassing them all. They would actually have to care and do something, and the odds of that happening quickly are close to zero. Um, I don't uh, I don't throw in all the SEO upselling. I don't put in the the map embeds and Google stacking. And, and and I know that stuff works. And what you'll find in SEO, especially when you start practicing minimum viable SEO, it's a lot of things in SEO work, but aren't worth doing. All right. Imagine hmm. that it works, but I'm going to lose money if I do it. And so you got to separate them now. It's not just does tactic A work. It's can I make money doing tactic A? And sometimes it's more important to ask that question first, because if it's not worth doing, you don't need to test if it actually works. You can save yourself time by asking the more important question, if it does work, is it worth doing? Do that part first. Amazing. Well, Ted, I think we have to be mindful of the time. Um, where do you want to push people? Where, where do you want the audience to find you? Um, well, I, I have a show as well called SEO Fight Club on YouTube. It's Tuesdays at uh, 9 a.m. So uh, later today, we're going to have an SEO uh, Fight Club episode. And we're going to talk about uh, public relations and press releases specifically and why SEOs are doing it wrong and old school PR folk are, uh, are killing it and how they get the press to pick up their stories and publish them. And so we're going to have that fight today. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It was fun chatting. Thank you. Cheers, Dave. All right. Take care.